this is uh, Ethical Choices in Games. And I hope you've been having such a great pack so far. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Not, not sarcastic. Oh, right. yeah, yeah. Get I'm excited sorry. for ethics. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so um, we'll do a quick introduction of who these wonderful four people are. Uh, and we'll start from over here. Hi, my name is Georgia Simmons. I'm a writer for games, um, both digital and analog, and for theatre as well. Uh, I'm David Harris, and I'm a games writer, theatre maker, and game designer. Well, I'm just a writer as well. Yes. <laughs> just, just a writer. Yeah, just a writer. A writer. A writer. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jane Cox. I am a PhD candidate in psychology and game design, and I also am the founder and director of a charity called Checkpoint, which acts at the intersection of mental health and games and technology. Uh, and I'm Steve Conway, I'm a lecturer at Swinburne University of Technology where I mainly teach design, uh, narrative and I suppose philosophy all in all. Great, okay, so that's <laughs> us. Thank you for the one rule. Um, <laughs> so we're here, oh no, yeah, there we go. Uh, so we're here to talk about uh, ethical choices in games, uh, but we have to quickly give a few, well maybe like a, a summation of what ethics means. Um, so I'm going to pass that on to Stephen, who's going to very quickly run us through what the idea of ethics might be, especially what we're going to be talking to in regards to that. Sure. So um, in Western philosophy, ethics comes from a Greek term, which is ethos, and that really means place, colloquially. It's just a way of saying place in the earliest Greek. So what ethics is, is basically virtuous behaviour within a specific place. So that's why we have medical ethics, we have business ethics, we have game ethics because it's about virtuous behaviour within a particular setting. So that brings in with it an uh, aesthetic argument which is what is good and bad, what is beautiful and ugly behaviour within a particular space is always tied to place context which is why it's different from morality which is universal. So that's really Western metaphysics in a nutshell. There you go, 10 seconds or so. <laughs> so awesome. Yeah. You've saved everyone a semester. Of <laughs> yeah, don't want to come to Swinburne. Oh, it's been recorded. Come to Swinburne. <laughs> uh, so we'll get started. Um, and my first question is to the panel, and we'll all, we'll all get to answer. Um, obviously, get, uh, I should stay pretty quickly. We're not just going to talk about digital games either. Like games is a broad term, so we'll, we'll talk about other forms of games as well. Uh, but what is the most unethical thing you have done in a game? Ooh. <laughs> Are you looking at me because I'm going or first? No. Great. When I was thinking about this question, I did actually think of a um, non-digital game, um, which was the school athletics carnival. Um, and I'm, I'm like a good athlete, but not a very good athlete. And so my strategy was to let all of the really keen girls sign up for the first heat. And then I would sign up in the heat with the people whose mums told them to compete and then win that heat and get through to the final. I wouldn't win the final, but I would have won something, so. <laughs> Um, I think one of the most unethical things I've done in a game, and, and it's interesting, like, so uh, when I was a kid playing Knights of the Old Republic, um, the game is well and truly out, so I don't care about spoilers, I'm sorry, uh, but uh, there's at one point when you can, you know, really take on the dark side or you can be light-sided, and I remember my mum was like, you're not getting this game if you're going to be evil. <laughs> And I was like, yes, I will be good, I will be the goodest goodie ever known. And my brother, like, was standing over my shoulder because he was, like, waiting for the big reveal. And he was like, oh, you're going to love this. The reveal happens, and then he's like, be evil. <laughs> <laughs> like, Just do it. Just do it. What could go wrong? <laughs> and, 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 I, and I was like, yeah, I guess so. I guess so, older brother. You are the voice of reason and judgment <laughs> in this scenario. I will be evil. And then I went like so evil, like I started killing off NPCs that I had loved and stuff. And I was just sitting there being like, why did they, why did they do this? <laughs> and even my brother was like, oh, I might have to tell mum now. <laughs> 
but yes, that was me. <laughs> okay, so you ready? Oh, this is bad. <laughs> so, no, years ago, um, I, I've probably done some pretty bad things in games, but years ago I um, used to play a lot with my children a game called Zoo Tycoon, right? We would build zoos and we would have... Did you play Zoo Tycoon? So, yeah, so we would build zoos and we noticed, you know, it, um, I had a little toddler at the time and he was just in love with this game and he would build his own little zoos and, and then I would change over to my username and build my little zoos and what we noticed was that when um, stuff would go wrong in the zoo, you'd see all the little characters, all the little dudes, they'd be running around and they'd start getting excited and so what we tried to do was tried to create situations which would make the little dudes go, ah! So, <laughs> so one night I was messing around and I discovered the ultimate situation which was to actually excavate um, a cave-like structure within the game, put a little dude down there, like just chuck him down there, <laughs> along with like a lion. <laughs> and that was really effective at making this little guy go, ah! and he would run around and it was terrible because he was going to be eaten by this lion. And I remember my son, he was three, when he opened it up the next day and saw this guy running around <laughs> going batshit crazy, he was mum, mum, we can't, and he, he fixed it. So that's pretty much the worst thing that I've done, <laughs> subjected someone to lion eating. Oh, that's, that's excellent. I think it's just <laughs> riffing on that. I think that's really fascinating, isn't it, that we can consider ourselves immoral or unethical when what we're doing really is manipulating pixels on a screen. You're, ju you're jumping um, ahead. I know, I'm sorry. That's just, I'm just going to highlight that just Come fascinates on. me. It's just pixels and clicks of a mouse and we feel bad. But that brings me to my example, which is, you know, we talk about systems of morality and ethics and we think we're such rational beasts, but when you think about it, when you, f you feel immorality and you feel um, being compromised ethically before you represent it mentally, and I absolutely felt this before I realised what I was doing when I was playing Counter-Strike, and um, what I did was I did not play Counter-Strike. I decided I was just going to walk around and knife my own team members. <laughs> um, and friendly fire was off, so it wasn't even effective, I was just irritating people. <laughs> so I was like the weirdest pacifist you've ever seen, just walking around, you know, scratching people. Um, and I realised, you know, going back to the definition, that I was actually being unethical in refusing to kill in warfare is unethical behaviour. Um, so that was a, a realisation for me. I, I felt, why is everyone treating me so badly? I just want to hug with my knife. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try it like that. Was can, game, someone, can someone take that context. out of context? Yeah, um, yeah. Quotes, yeah. yeah. I just want to hug I'm with a knife. I'm those out of context <laughs> quotes. Please don't quote me on that. Um, but yeah, that was my unethical behaviour, refusing to kill. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so as, so as Stephen kind of brings up, like ethics can be different. Um, it's not just kind of one base grounds. I mean, there are uh, ethics within certain contexts as well. Uh, but I suppose what we're all here, the one question that we, I think we would all kind of agree on, but we might play a little bit devil's advocate maybe. Uh, but does practicing unethical behaviors in a game make you more likely to behave unethically in real life? <coughs> No. Does anyone want to jump in and start off? Oh, you, you know what my critique's going to be. Go, go. It'll go. bore everyone. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I do not like this distinction when someone says real. Uh, and David knows that very well. That's why he baited me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, this, this, this notion of real versus, I mean, versus what? I don't, I don't understand it. What we are, we, it's like we pretend that fantasy is not real. Um, and we're in a materialist culture, a scientific culture, where we believe that there's real and then there's fantasy. Um, but no matter how you define it, the real and the fantasy collide. They are one and the same. I mean, even if you want to talk in materialist terms, I will ask you, you know, if you say you're real, I will say, well, have you had the same impact that Harry Potter's had on economics? Have you had the same impact Harry Potter has had on culture, on fashion, even on pedagogy? No, I don't think so. Um, so am I less real than, than Harry Potter? So, to win. Um, games play 
real life uh, are intrinsically linked. All games are are a commitment of belief as these irrational beings as we all are. We, we throw our belief into something, you know, meaning this is what we do when we, when we play a game. We, we commit a moment of magical realism where we go, and I say to you, the floor is lava. And you can reject that, but if you go along with it, you attribute new meaning to the world around you. You say, oh my God, now the floor means something else. And if you go along with it, all of a sudden your world changes and the meaning of your world changes. And that's what we do, you know, there's nothing innate in a spear of leather pumped with air that makes it the most important thing in the world. But when I play soccer, I am, I broke ribs, leg, and oh my God, and collarbone uh, for a ball of air. <laughs> so you tell me uh, where the real and, you know, the fantasy are separated. Um, so, can we displace our ethical systems? I, I, think, I think that does violence to our um, sense of, we're, we're very able to switch meaning, we're very able to switch between what we call worlds, the world of Korean cuisine, the world of games, the world of business. We've got various worlds we're in which things mean different things, but um, certainly I think bleed can and will occur. If you look at toys, um, as a kid, I was given G.I. Joes and I was told to go outside and play. Um, my contemporaries, women, were told to play with Barbie dolls, play dress up, play the doll's house. So you can see how they're trying to influence a certain understanding of maleness and femaleness, femininity, masculinity. So there's certainly a, mm. a sense in our culture and society that we can, through play and games, train people to behave in certain ways. Mm. Uh, over to you guys. I think that um, uh, in terms of like uh, ethical behaviour in a video game and whether it has an impact on your behaviour in real life, um, I wouldn't subscribe to the notion that like killing in a game makes you more likely to kill in real life. It's like you know, however many murders you rack up in digital space makes you more likely to kill. Like that's patently ridiculous. But I think that there's um, a wider kind of influence within any given game of like the system and what the system of that game punishes and rewards and the mm -hmm. kinds of behaviours that that trains you into or the kinds of modes of thinking that that puts you in. Um, Stephen was making a really good point earlier about um, violent games don't necessarily make you more likely to kill, obviously, mm. um, but because they put you in a system of fear and a system where behaving fearfully is rewarded and behaving suspiciously, like suspe suspecting other people around you is rewarded, those kinds of media can tend to make us more suspicious of the world around us and more fearful of the world around us and so those kinds of like consequences of in-game behaviour and real world behaviour are not necessarily one to one but it's sort of more mm. of a question of the system than of any one act of behaviour that you commit. Absolutely and I just wanted to build on um, some of that talk about the research into the effects of um, playing violently um, contextual games. Um, you might be behaving in a, in a shooter, you killing everything, you're levelling up, but you might be doing it in the context of a cooperative team environment. And so what you're actually functionally doing is you're problem solving in a team. And so this can actually be a really effective pro-social thing. So whilst the context might be violent, the action is pro-social. So there's actually a lot of evidence that's suggesting that these types of games can actually be beneficial and pro-social. Absolutely, and I was going to point into the fact that often when we talk about ethics in games, we obviously talk about negative ethics in games rather than any kind of positive, positive side mm. or, or positive behaviour. And I think um, you know, if we look at games, uh, especially uh, as a way of training, so to speak, they have a lot of them have fundamentally failed. Like they're not great at training us to do things. Um, if if a game was really good at training you to do things then you would be really good at like, at bo like, so like, you know the cards that you get when you go get coffee and they like stamp it? That's a game. That's a really, really, really bad game, but it's a game, <laughs> yeah? But it doesn't make you like, I, I've thrown so many of them out and like they haven't, hasn't trained me to buy the coffee there and bring it out every time. And so I, I, I find it strange when a lot of people have this, this fear monger, I guess, uh, about, about, you know, these games being like, they're gonna teach us how to do crazy stuff, and like, oh, I wish. I wish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I'd, I'd love to be able to wall run like in Prince of Persia or do something like that, you know. I well, think 
Yeah, I think you've all brought up a really interesting point, which is that these people who, who say this, they fear monger and they say, games will make you violent. Um, they think they're hyper-rationalist, but what I'm doing is I'm clicking a mouse and pressing WSAD on a keyboard. Yeah. I'm pulling RT on a game controller. That is vastly different from holding a gun in your hand and pulling a trigger in front of someone. Mm -hmm. And yet they make this irrational leap to, to fully believe in this fantasy of the screen without forgetting, well, well, actually forgetting, that games are an embodied phenomenon. You're always in a body when you're playing a game. And sitting on my couch going, yeah, take it. Yeah, I knew it, I'm brilliant. That, that is not the same as running around a field shooting people in the face with a real gun. But people, yeah. but people do that. People do play paintball. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. That's a, that's a game. So we've, got, we've, got, we've got literally Indeed. a game down the stairs where it's like a laser game. So, yeah. so yeah. What, what's the context in that? Absolutely. So that's where I do believe um, bleed out can happen, as we call it, which is, you know, I think it's well established uh, currently in America that um, playing certain sports uh, like American football can make you an aggressive person in your day-to-day -day dealings uh, interpersonally. Um, because the game as a system, I mean, you know, it's a bit off topic. What, what is American football but cavalry warfare? It's, it's the Civil War. It's America living out the memory of the Civil War. They're kind of traumatically reliving their own Civil War every time. It's just, you know, this classic warfare formation and giving ground, taking ground and all of that. Um, so it does promote this warlike mentality and the clashing of the bodies, the aggressiveness, the diminution of someone to just an object to defeat. Um, I, I think that can have effects, um, but sitting on my couch pulling a trigger uh, on a controller or clicking a mouse button is mm. ludicrous. And that's, I mean, the, there's an interesting crossover there as well in terms of like the increasing popularity of VR and like that's kind of a middle ground because again it's not quite as physically engaged as, as a contact sport but that's like, you know, even just like I was playing one of the archery ones recently and the difference between this and this is already vastly different. It's sort of like, what will the effects of that be? I also just wanted to pick up on something um, that you were saying, Jane, about um, like a, a violent game, uh, a, a violent game, a game with violent content, but uh, building, team building kind of yeah. skills. I would definitely agree with that, but I think one thing that is worth questioning is why so many games, like such a vast majority of games, do have violent content oh, as, their, I agree. as their subject matter. Like we need to get more creative with mechanics. Yeah, it's just boring. Why do we need to shoot stuff all yeah. the time? Yeah. 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 Great. All right, well, I might jump on to the next question. Uh, so I, I, think, I think we're all in agreement there that yes and no, but mostly no. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Well summarised. Go away. Yes. Um, <laughs> there's no to net down. Yeah. Well, just, <laughs> yes, but no, but mostly no. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, are video games the ultimate uh, format to practice and test ethics? So, video games obviously being a great mm. place, because there, there is essentially little or no consequence outside of that scenario. I think that makes them a terrible place to practice nice, ethics. Why? Because there's no consequence. Yes. Because we learn from consequences, we learn from being uncomfortable. And if you're too comfortable, you can sort of pat yourself on the back and be like, I did the right thing, great. Um, now I'll go and shout at some people online. You know, I think if the current, <laughs> if the current state of affairs tells us anything... But it's that the, does have you know, consequence. I think, I think people communicating online like that, like okay. So it's it's in, it's it's within the game world. But as we are be, being haven't been more aware, the way that we communicate online can be extremely detrimental. Oh, that's so, what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, sorry. I mean, outside of the context of the game, you like play okay. a game, you think you practice good ethics, and then you go over here and sort of like still be a terrible person. Yes. Not that everyone's a terrible person. Not that anyone's a terrible person. You know. <laughs> well, there are definitely terrible people. But that's a, uh, terrible <laughs> behaviour, maybe. Yeah. yeah. No, that's that's, yes. that's, that's, that's <laughs> Terrible Sorry, ethics. Oh. <laughs> um, Jane, did you have an idea on that? Like, well, on that idea of being the format, being a, a good place, and that, those consequences. Yeah, no, I'm going to completely agree with Georgia. I, I, I think we learn um, uh, when when we work out our ethics and our, our behaviours. Um, we form neural pathways to inform us to behave in certain ways. And um, I think in order to do that really effectively, consequences and feedback loops are just absolutely vital um, to allow us to behave in certain ways. So yeah, I, I'm going to agree with Georgia there. 
on, on that, sorry, I'm just, I'm just cutting just for a moment. On that level of consequence, uh, yeah. what about games that have that are very roguelike, or like uh, games such as DayZ, where you know uh, to, to enact upon someone in that game can be quite a detrimental thing. Um, you know, they lose everything, they have to start all over again. Is, mm. are, are there any games out there that you think do have a good level of con consequence to them, or is it just still? to held in the virtual world or this, this game world? Yeah, I think when you're talking about real life ethics and, and actually changing someone's um, ethical stance, I'm not sure that um, games are going to be an effective tool or um, place to do that in. When, when you bring it back and talk more about explicit behaviours or patterns of thinking, maybe that's where we can start to utilise game worlds and game mechanics to actually impact on people and the ways that they might be thinking and feeling. Mm. So, yeah. Great. Yeah, I think the worst thing that ever happened to ethics in games was the save system. Um, <laughs> allowing people to save their game completely undermined any commitment to meaning. Um, you know, imagine, again, if we're playing soccer and I say, oh, I know you scored and you're 2-0 up, but can, we, can I just re re reload and I'll go from that checkpoint where you, were, you, know, you looked a bit and I maybe can break your leg? Um, so, yeah, it's, it's absolutely about consequence um, and seeing the consequences of one's actions. And, I mean, but, of course, um, when games became a consumer commodity, you're not going to go and sell something to someone and say, oh yeah, but um, you can only play it once and you, everything you do, you can only do it once and then it's like you can't play it anymore. Uh, <laughs> no one is going to buy your product. So, so this is the conflict between ethics and uh, commodities. Um, commodities and ethics don't generally have an easy relationship. Um, as a consumer, you are all powerful and power is antithetical to freedom because freedom comes from limitation. You have to make a choice and that is being free. If you have no power, you can't make a choice. If you are all powerful, you never make a choice because you can do everything all the time. Either way, you're not free. Freedom is somewhere in the middle and the safe system makes you all powerful. You're a god in games um, and that is not good for ethics. I want to just dive into something that you said sort of halfway through that, which is a little bit off topic, but I think it would be good to address. Um, the idea that um, a consumer game has to be replayable to be viable, um, and that a consumer good has to be reusable to be um, viable in the market. And I think in most other areas we see that's not true. Most clothes don't even last a year. A meal doesn't even last an hour. Like, why do we have this idea that a game has to be played multiple times to be good? I just like, there's, there's no stuff I just want to but, throw that But out. on that note, I mean, we're seeing the rise, this is now getting into a, a weirder space, but I think, we, I think I can draw it back. Um, <laughs> good luck. Because we're seeing the rise of legacy games. Have you heard about that? Yes. Yeah, the board yeah, games. The board games. Yeah, yes. like, you, like you buy them and you play them once and like that's it, like they're mm. destroyed. So yeah. there's a new one called Seafall and like they literally get you to destroy the in the it's thing. It's terribly <laughs> off-putting. No, I love that. Boy. It's great. It's great. Rip, rip something I just like bought. It. I like it. I like it. Oh <laughs> right. That's good. That's good. So, so I think like so in in that regards, and also in regards to consequences. Do, um, so we're talking about games, especially uh, a digital form of games. But mm -hmm. what about uh, physical forms of games, like like those board games that we play in front of other people? I mean, if anyone in this room has played Diplomacy. You you know you're an unethical oh, wow. yeah you know you're an unethical person now like, <laughs> or like when you play Monopoly and like you're playing these games that like there's no screen to hide behind yeah. you are you are an unethical coup yeah. coup coup yeah exactly oh, yeah. werewolf and you know oh yeah subterfuge if anyone's a mobile gamer yes. <laughs> I still don't talk to one person so <laughs> I cannot see that person so so do you, so. In, in, in regards to that consequence, mm. do you see that consequence changing if you're face to face with that person, or do you see it change? Like, do you think there's much of a difference ethically? Yeah, yeah. I think I think there's and still what is it? yeah. I think there's there's still it would still be very difficult to create a game that would sort of enforce an ethical principle in like a meaningful and sustainable way, like that people would play the game once or twice and be like, aha, I'm an ethical person now, off I go. Um, I don't <laughs> think that would really be doable, but I do think that there is a huge difference between when you're sort of like betraying someone or acting unethically towards someone face to face in a game versus online. Like we've seen time and again that people will do 
whatever they like online um, because the, you don't have to look that person in the eye because you don't have to be present for the consequences on that person. Because one thing that is worth bringing up is that whilst games don't have, while, whilst the actions we might take in games don't have the same impact as their analog equivalent in real life, shooting someone in a game is not the same as shooting a, a, a living, breathing body. Um, there are still consequences, and for me that brings up ideas around um, certain court cases that have started to emerge of assault in a game context, particularly sexual assault in a game context, where one player has been assaulted by another player, and there's, you know, like, on the one hand, the argument would be, like, that's nonsense, it's just pixels, you didn't get sexually assaulted, and on the other hand, it's like, I'm immersed in this world, I um, identify with this avatar who is now being mistreated, and that's like a traumatic experience. That is different than a bodily Absolutely. sexual assault, but still does have consequences. And this is even more important now that we're getting into VR mm. and, and um, cooperative VR play, is that that kind of um, acting on another individual within those game worlds actually does have real, very real consequences on the feelings um, of that other person. So it's really important. Yeah, VR has a whole nother like kettle of fish oh, when it comes sorry. to like, I just every. Oh, but it's no, but it's great. I mean, I mean, the ethics of VR in itself is just a, a, a cesspool of just like 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 as developers, pe people are not people aren't thinking about this. People aren't like putting like developers aren't putting boxes or body like. A personal space around their That's avatars. Right. They're only just starting to implement that now, That's and that right. only comes about from people people like transgressing those ethics. Yeah. And I think as game developers or as people who play games, we need to really think about what are what are the what are these boundaries before they get destroyed, before someone breaks them. That's right. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. 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 I was going to say I played the um, the zero latency VR cooperative play experience, the puzzle game Imaginarium last night and there's six people, they're all wearing backpacks, it's free roaming play and they've developed the mechanics within the game so that you can see when you're getting too close to another player um, so that you don't bump into those other players or they don't touch you inappropriately or something like that whilst you're playing the game. So systems like that are going to be really important to build in. Yeah, and, um, I think as a few people here know I was a um, design consultant on IRL shooter Patient Zero if anyone played that whilst it was in Melbourne. And what it is basically is uh, you get dressed up in SWAT gear in this um, reformulated warehouse on the edge of Melbourne and you run through and we hired like a hundred actors dressed as zombies to crash through walls and come at you and they all had IR sensors and your gun had a laser, it was beautiful technology, you know, a laser built into it that you could shoot the zombies and so on. And we needed a psychologist on staff to talk certain people down afterwards or, or mid-game and take them out of the game. Um, because that, that commitment to meaning that is the essence of any of us um, can be so overwhelmingly real yeah. um, that these people, yes, I mean, the, the, they, we, we were kind of compromised ethically, I feel. Mm. It was interesting. Mm. 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 Well, that brings me on to my next question. Uh, is there an ethical difference between play and games? Yes. <laughs> just, um, just, not, just before we go on, do yes. we want to define playing games a little bit? So that way Professor? We can, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, okay, so... One minute, uh, 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 Yeah, yeah, one minute, okay. <laughs> Thousands of years of history, yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, pe people join playing games together that they're not similar at all. Um, best way I can explain it in a minute is they're like siblings that hate one another or maybe a, a father-son relationship that's went really sour. Um, so play is the dad of games, but they are non-speaking terms. Um, basically, the son's fault. Yeah, it really, it really is. Um, so play is cardinal injunction. If you ever think about playing in its purest sense, play is cardinal injunction. Is yes, yes, yes. Can I be a tree? Yes. I'm now an aeroplane. Yes. Can I go play over there? Yes. Is that now the score token? Yes. Is the floor now lava? Yes. That's what you do whenever you see children play in the purest sense. Game is no. Can I play? No. What about if I go over that side of the line? No. Can I use my hands? No. It hates you. Um, game, game is, you know, it's a system of oppression within which, yeah, it's a set of rules that oppresses you wherein you find freedom. You work within the limitations. Any beautiful game design gives you just enough freedom to express yourself within the limits of the system. 
play is almost an overwhelming, vertiginous sense of freedom. It's, it's overwhelming. You can do anything. Watch children play and how often they just switch up what they're doing. It's, it's, I can't even get in that mindset anymore. It's so overwhelmingly free. And that's, that's why we have playtesters. So like, people Indeed. are playing and then the game designers can go, ah. No. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did that? Yeah. No. I, I can offer that. First thing in IRL shooters, so Patient Zero, before I came in, they had it set up almost like a roller coaster ride. They were like, so people are going to enter the warehouse and they're, you know, a SWAT team and we, you know, they're going to walk forward and then go left and then go into one room and solve the puzzle and then go right. And I was like, the first thing they're going to do is walk through and start kicking doors and ripping down shit. And of course, it's exactly what happened the first time people walked in. Um, they turned back on themselves and tried to go back where they just came from, started kicking down the doors. And, and the next thing they started doing was using these very fragile, sophisticated laser guns to smash doors open, breaking the lasers. And they were like, oh, yeah, you were right. Oh, dear. So, so that's it. We have this. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So we have a difference. So what is the ethical difference? Like, what, 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 what is there? Or what, what is that? Following on from that definition, if... Um, play is that kind of open, yes, childlike kind of state, and a game is a fixed system of no's, then I think that there's a much greater ethical responsibility on a player in a play context. If you're actively setting the parameters as you go, then your ethical responsibility is very high to the people around you, and that play system can only flourish, everyone can only be and stay in that, in that state of yes if everyone is behaving ethically towards one another and keeping each other comfortable. Um, in a game, whilst players still have an ethical responsibility, a huge onus is on the game designer to set up a system of ethics within what they're designing. Um, and mm. player, because players are limited in what they can and can't do and will behave in the way that you have designed for them to behave, there is a big onus on the game designer to uh, design ethically or to design an ethical system. Mm. I just wanted to touch on the positivity of the, the relationship between this father and son and, and play and game and just say that they are related, like they do have something in common and that is that we engage in these things willingly, we choose to do these activities and so there is a certain amount of free will associated with the choice to engage in that free form play or, you know, the naughty son of no, which is that games and the system of rules. We still choose to engage with that. So. Now let's talk about the positivity of a no as well. You know, there's this idea that yes is good and no is bad, but no is sometimes good. Mm. And to set limits is sometimes good and to um, make a space that has set parameters is sometimes a very fun or safe or interesting thing to do. Hmm. What do you think, David? Uh, I'm, just, I'm just in awe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think it's interesting, the idea that, like, that we, um, this idea of that game designers have this ethical responsibility once it becomes game. Where for me, I, I certainly, when, when I have designed games or experiences, I've certainly put that onus on the players. Because for me, it's, it's so, a, a lot of the stuff that I try to make is about subverting these ethical ideas, subverting what we consider rules and structures. And so I'm trying to highlight the fact that, well, yes, you know, if you wanted to, one of you could stand up right now and shout at the top of your lung, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but you know, but there are so, certain social schemas and like rules that we all follow, and like we're just holding on here, and we're being quote unquote ethical people, um, and the, that's the same kind of ethics that are being applied to you right now that is stopping you from like really changing things. Like uh, you know, there, there are people in need. Um, I, I don't want to get on my political rant, but <laughs> like there are certain issues in our society that are only not getting changed because we are expected to behave a certain way or to mm. behave ethically. So when, when, when you're a designer, yes, I think the responsibility for you to create the environment is, but when it's about the players, I still think, are, are like at the, at the core, they, they, they're the ones who hold the most. I, I, See, I think I mean. this is a key difference between digital and analog. Um, because once you've designed your digital game, obviously you can make patches and everything, but ultimately you don't really ever see the players whilst they're playing or like that would be quite rare and so you kind of have and like there are like fixed things that can and can't happen digitally in the programming of that game so that's a, a bit more fixed and it's a bit more like you can't like people can't really revolt or like there are interesting examples of people revolting against the system but it's 
widely considered an accident and not how to play the game. Whereas in an analog game, you can kind of design it to be broken. And I think, I think you're right. I think the fact that people will sometimes like be playing a game and be like, oh, I couldn't do that. It was just the game. Like I couldn't make that choice because the game said not to. And then the fact that we, you know, actively sort of live our lives the way we would do whilst other people are in need, those things are related. Um, and I think that um, designing a game to be broken is kind of an interesting thing to think about. Or um, there were some visiting theatre makers from Spain that David worked with recently who had this piece where um, the actors were like shoveling dirt onto this um, conveyor belt that was um, going up somewhere and you couldn't really see where it was going. And then as the lights came up, you could see that the dirt was falling, falling into this pit um, and there was a real human person in there and there was no safety strategy for how that person would not die. Um, and those, those Spanish guys ran loose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, were happy, they were happy to put any of us yeah. in any situation. Yeah, yeah and, and they didn't tell the audience that. They didn't tell the audience, oh, don't worry, he's safe. Um, and the whole idea was that the audience were meant to revolt against this system and stop them from doing their show. But they never told them that. Um, but apparently, like, no one's ever died. Um, <laughs> but I think that if you did that piece in Australia, people would die because we're so used to just sitting back and being like, oh yeah, someone else has got it. Like, it's, you know, I'm just doing the thing. Like, I'm, I'm performing my role. And I, but I think, that's, I think that's still the same in digital worlds as well. I think, I think people can behave in certain ways in digital worlds. I mean, like, this is, again, this is a long boat of stretch, but I'll bring it back around. Uh, but like in Mountain Blade, uh, there's like a mod, in, in a, a Napoleon mod in which you play as civil, like, well, not civil war, Napoleonic era men uh, fighting in whatever campaign. And there's obviously all the classes, like, you know, um, demolition dude and so on and so forth. But then there's musician. And the amount of people that are like, oh, we're just going to put all this combat to the side and we're just going to be musicians. <laughs> the whole game will just be musicians sitting around or dancing around and, like, we, we'll create, we'll, we'll subvert the narrative, like the, the design of this game, and we'll create some new ethics, which is if you kill one of the musicians, then that is like the biggest dishonorable thing you can do. Mm. And I think, I think we shouldn't, like, and again, that's far more a multiplayer aspect, mm. but mm. I think we can create those, those sub, sub, yeah, subverts of mm. ethics. Right? Yeah. And of course, we probably shouldn't forget the medium. Which, you know, I mean, the digital medium is a zero one machine. Um, it's in essence, it's a consequentialist machine. It calculates. So uh, that's vastly different to a theatre piece or to an analog game, um, which comes along with a bunch of other questions we probably don't have time for. Yeah. Um, Next year. But yeah, but we, you know, we are massively social creatures, aren't we? And when yeah. that great example of the conveyor belt, you know, it reminds me of the Milgram experiments, um, you know, where someone wears a white coat, brings you into a lab and says, electrocute that person, and they go, all right. You know, and they go, don't worry, it's my responsibility. I'm an expert, just press the buzzer. And the person on the other side is uh, an actor, so they're just pretending. But still, the person feels fine cranking up the voltage um, because you know it's a classic bystander effect the more people around you the less autonomy you feel you have um, and as a society we're more surrounded by people than ever so we feel an immense pressure to fit in um, which is maybe good maybe bad mm. I'm in no position to say mm. okay last question before we open up to you guys asking questions uh, this is a pretty simple one. I think we're going to learn to. Uh, have you ever been aware of a game manipulating your ethics? <laughs> do, you to, do you want me to give an example? Yes. Okay. So Bioshock 1. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Got it? Yep. Yep, that's it. Uh, they, they, they like offer you to, 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 to harvest the little sisters or they say oh just let them go oh come on <laughs> yeah i'm gonna kill the little sisters yeah so for me it was it was clear cut what they wanted me to do it wasn't like a question as to like i wasn't sitting there going oh god do i kill little children or do i not kill little children oh man so and, and for me immediately i, I just I, it, 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 it's a great game but really really annoyed me and i think as, as like as game players I'm sure all of you know like certain games you're like oh yeah I knew exactly what I had to do in that state and it was 
is posed to me as like a real hard ethical choice. Mm. Have yeah. you guys ever experienced that? Well, don't undermine it. There's a reason I'm not allowed back in England, David. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, see, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and worse yet, as I touched on, the computer is calculating machine uh, brings with it a mode of thinking we have to offer points, points all the time. So, of course, if anyone recalls that Bioshock moment, um, you actually get more add-on, which is the main resource of the game, um, if you save the little sisters rather than killing them. So when I played it, it, didn't, it wasn't even an ethical dilemma. It was a problem solution. I kind of went, how much more resource will I get? And I looked and went, oh, I get less for killing them. Reload, save. <laughs> I couldn't care less if I killed them or not. I just wanted more Adam. <laughs> um, you know, and that's, that's because the computer is calculating machine in its very design says to you, well, calculate. Mm. And that's what I did, I calculated. So it undermined the entire uh, morality of the system. Mm. Mm. I guess I was going to, what immediately came to mind there is the, all the Telltale series games and, and the choices that you faced with there, um, with the ethical dilemmas. I, I haven't actually played a great deal of them, but that's what I immediately thought of. But also, um, life is strange. Um, mm. Anyone mm. Came, across, came across that game who's played Life is Strange? Yeah, so... Heaps of people. So I found one scene in particular, and I won't spoil it for those who want to play but haven't played it, um, really quite um, distressing almost um, because I knew that the objective um, was to behave in a, in a very pro-social and saviour type way and felt um, that, yeah, I, I, I guess it was pushing me towards a series of options which landed me not doing the thing that I wanted to do. And uh, so, yeah, I, mm. I found that to be quite challenging. Mm. <coughs> um, I'm going to question the question. Oh, um, <laughs> because it, it seems like in the question that um, something overtly manipulating your ethics is like a bad thing or like not good design or something like this. Um, and I feel like it's probably like a taste judgment that I would agree with, <laughs> but that yeah. like not everyone would. And the like when I was trying to think of an example just then of what, like what's a time I feel like the game has like maybe preached ethics to me. Um, the example I came up with is a game that I know has meant something to a lot of people, um, which is Depression Quest. Um, and I personally just got really switched off by how overt the sort of like message in that game was. Um, but that's a personal response and as I said, I know that game has meant so much to so many people to see that experience represented and made like playable in the sense that people can sort of like show it to friends and family as well and be like, hey, here's what it's like. Um, I've, you know, personally had enough of my like people close to me go through depression and anxiety to not need that game. Um, but I think it's a really valuable thing and I think the fact that it overtly manipulates your ethics or your feelings about the subject is not a design flaw, it's a design strength in that instance. Mm. Um, mm. Games that subtly um, slap you in the face, I, if you can do that subtly. Um, <laughs> I, I, I always think of games like uh, Braid, where you know, you're playing it, it feels like a very conventional Mario-esque game, you're chasing the princess, I'm going to rescue you, I'm the hero, and then of course it completely flips and you're the stalker and she's actually being saved from you. And that changes that entire emotional experience of I'm going to save this person to do I continue playing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Am I being That's unethical right. now in chasing this person? What um, was the name of Braid. B R A I D, yes. Mm. <laughs> um, probably galvanise the entire indie scene, I suppose. Um, yeah, it's very interesting how it's, it pulls the rug from under you, you know, and it says, what you're doing, is that okay with you? And the more you play, you're kind of going, ah, oh, uh, do I, and you know, then you make all these weird decisions like, ah, oh, do I play it for the achievements? Oh, that's disgusting of me. I just want the achievement and, you know, oh, I'm, so, I'm such a consumer. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's very bizarre. A lot of conflict over that. Capitalism's yeah. nice. Indeed. <laughs> cool. So we'll open up the floor now to questions from the audience. If you want to jump up to just move your way to the microphone. Would, uh, would an enforcer be able to kind of... Uh, enforce? 
Yeah, enforce. Let's talk about the fact that the yeah. people who volunteer at this conference are called enforcers. Did you guys realise this? Like they're enforcing. Yeah, they behavior. are the game system. You're in the matrix. <laughs> hey guys, this mic is like super free. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, but like, look. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, um, let's, uh, let's start yeah. with uh, this side, because that's the longest side. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were, we were, uh, you were talking about, um, like, the idea of, like, overtly sort of influencing your views. I just wanted to know if you'd ever encountered games that did it more subtly, like, what comes to mind for me would be, uh, The Beginner's Guide, which yeah. is a very slow descent into changing the way you thought about it, but of course you can't really talk about The Beginner's Guide, because <laughs> the games want you to talk about The Beginner's Guide, um, so it's kind of difficult there, and at the end, it did feel more overt than anything. So mm -hmm. it's the only example I know of. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm going to go super cliche and say Dark Souls. No. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Wrong answer. Enjoy. <laughs> I'm wondering if I could get through an entire panel without you. I know. I know. <laughs> Dark Souls. I know. We're so Enjoy close. Enjoy Savannah. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, you know, Dark Souls, Demon Souls is really the, the best example, the first one, where um, the more you play it, the more people are very subtly questioning your motivations, you'll need to consume the entire world, which is a really interesting critique of consumerism. Um, why are you doing this? Why are you killing everything? Why? And then the end, the, the final, final boss in one of the hardest games of the past 20 years, doesn't put up any resistance, and you go, oh, oh, I'm the bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> and then you carry on playing, because it's so much fun. <laughs> Proving the point of the game, no doubt, that you are scum. So, I am scum, I should say. <laughs> yeah, so that's my example. Did you want to? Yeah, no. Ah, no. Um, I think, oh yeah, that's a really hard one. I, I have to admit, I don't think, and, and like the beginner's guide, so again, I come from a world of theatre, and so there's this, oh, fantastic, we know, we know each other. Um, <laughs> but like, things like the beginner's guide for me, I was like, oh, that was terrible. Like, mm -hmm. I, like I, because I was so annoyed about like, where it could have gone and what it could have done, and I'd, I've seen works that have done things like that really, really powerful. And I just think game development is still in a really young state. I, I don't think that like, we're, I equate it to, um, it's when movies discovered sound. And then suddenly things like, like there's like, oh, there's a whole bunch of different jobs that we can like offer, like there's people audio. Can talk. Yeah, people can talk. Um, and I think game development's getting to a point now when we're like, ah, oh, actually there's a lot more out there than just like shoot 'em ups and you know, grand strategies and so on and so forth. And we're actually starting to really branch out. And I'm really excited to see what that provides. And I think the beginner's guide is a great example of like the start, but it's just a poor execution, I think. And I think we can only get better once we delve into this a bit more. I think yeah. to, to answer the question of, um, you know, like a, a game that has influenced your ethics more subtly, um, I, I think my answer would be like, I don't know, because it did it so subtly. <laughs> um, but it's, it's probably happened a lot of times. But, um, and I think, you, I think those games, you can kind of tell while you're playing them. Like, if a game makes you feel a way that you're unaccustomed to in that, like in that example you were talking about where like, the behavior is usually like, you kill someone, you feel achievement, and if you're playing a game and you're suddenly like, you kill someone, you feel awful, as if you've just killed someone. Like, that's probably, like, that's the feel. Yeah, and George's point about depression is having that personal response. We shouldn't forget that players have the power of interpretation. You know, I, you've heard this again, Savannah. But, I, you know, I played Mario as a child, and then I came back to it, and I'm like, damn, I'm some genocidal plumber hepped up on mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> What, you know, do you, do you imagine on the come down after sucking up all the mushroom, Mario just looks around the room with just these corpses of Koopa drivers and he's just like, shit, did I do it again? <laughs> Alright, let's use that great punchline to go to the next one. <laughs> anyway. Hey guys, um, so you spoke briefly about people who kind of like manipulate or subvert the mechanics of the game to act unethically. Um, yes, it's the best. Did, uh, it's amazing, isn't it? James <laughs> spoke briefly about stuff like um, Sue Tycoon. I know people do it on Rollercoaster Tycoon and The Sims, where like they deliberately kill people 
Um, or even like simple stuff. Chuck like, them in a swimming pool, take out the leather. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Or like, 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 in more moderate ways, like I know a friend of mine once decided to get the one team that they hated from the EPL on a beatbox, <laughs> set the game to the highest difficulty and go through career mode just to watch them get relegated. It wasn't Manchester United, was it? <laughs> no. Cool. It's fine. I think, it's good. I think it's, I think it's just fun. Like, yeah. everyone locked a sim in a room one time, like, <laughs> it's just, I, and it's an example of, like, play winning over games, you know, it's an example of, like, I, I think, like, I don't think too hard about the ethics there, especially where it's a thing where you're playing against an NPC, I think that urge is always coming from a place of, like, ooh, I've discovered something I know I'm not meant to do. Mm. Um, I think that's the, that's the overwhelming thing, and I think that's a great thing to encourage in people, like, ooh, I found the... I found the door that says it's locked but isn't actually locked. That's right. And it's like goes back to that, you know, play is the yes and the game is the no. And so we want to know what are the boundaries of those rules yep. within yep. the game that we're constrained by. So it's, it might be bad, unethical, but it's actually exploration. How far can we take this? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Battlefield 2, the first person shooter, you can play as a medic. You can go around and remind you get teammates. After which the other player can select, say thank you, actually, with the communication menu, say thank you message. When the signal came up, Battlefield 3, that was automated. So you get the thank you message with guards mm. on the other player. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> the the <laughs> automated. Then everyone's just like, you've got to the few people who choose to thank me for bringing back to life. Uh, what does the panel think about positive, ethical, and moral choices as a motivator? And what's the good examples of? Well, I think the like I, I prefer the version of that game where you do choose to say thank you or not. Like I think that's just an interesting little feature. But also, if you're being a doctor to get people to say thank you to you, you might want to like reconsider. You know, like <laughs> that should that shouldn't be a very strong motivator. You're saving a life. You know? <laughs> I actually um I'm playing Battlefield One at the moment, and I'm really bad at FPSs, so I just play the medic, and I actually don't. <laughs> I just die a lot, and I'm just like constantly like yeah, good, that does it. And I get so much hate. I get so much hate for doing what I wanted, what I'm, what I'm doing in the game. And people are like, oh, you're the, you're horrible at this. You're really bad. Why didn't you res me? And so I was like, and I'm like, well, I'm I apologised about that, yeah, David. Yeah. I was angry that night. <laughs> so, so I was waiting for that apology. It's a whole point of the panel. He's wanted that a while. Um, but I think what we we use like commendations and stuff in games as um, like very poorly. Like, for example, like Dota, like everyone's gonna not like who come in, come in, he gives like good, like you know, good player, that guy was great. Like, mm -hmm. it's, it's, we, we, are, we are predisposed to get angry at other people we don't know than we are to like give them positive reinforcement. Mm -hmm. And so that's just the nature of things. We often see in others the worst, especially when they're not here. But if I'm playing a game, a board game, and someone like does something great, I'll be like, that was a fantastic play. Like if I play Magic the Gathering and someone like just destroys me in a couple of turns, like, mm -hmm. good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think it's an authoritarian move to, to make people say thank you. I think it undermines a player's freedom, so it's unethical. To but I guess it, uh, like, I bet that it came out of people playing the game yep. being like, oh, this is a waste of time. Yep. We have to thank people. Yep. Like, it's just like it's horrible. Feedback. Yeah, they implement yeah. a feedback system. Yeah. <laughs> rewarded in the game because it makes you win more easily, but you don't get that, 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 that sense of someone actually thanking you. Sure. That was mm. important. Sure. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. It's, it's sad. But yeah. yeah. Mm. We, we probably should thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> Hi, um, I'm really horrible at making decisions in real life. I'm like really slow and I think about things for a really long time. Um, when I go play a Tell Tower game, I'm absolutely crippled. Like, oh, do no, I no. sort of spend like off or do I then die? Like, what do I do? Um, but after I play these games, I find day to day so much easier. Like, <laughs> yes, I know what t shirt I want because it's red or white, not white. Or and can you see the counter bar, like, just like disappearing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How many other people would have made this decision? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is a question, is there any evidence that that is a thing for people? Can they use games to help improve their 
improve their lives in those sorts of ways? Sure. Yeah, I can, I can probably talk to that. Absolutely, yes. And this is what uh, a lot of development, a lot of research is going into um, developing games which help people practice day-to-day um, -day skills. So like you're talking about the decision-making process and how the Telltale game allows you to actually practice that skill and then you can apply that in your daily life. So there's other games. Um, I'll just quickly talk about like uh, biofeedback game Nevermind. Um, which is a horror genre game. Um, you're faced with awful evils and all of these kinds of things, but what it actually is, is it's a relaxation game. It actually is training you by showing you, um, presenting you with all these horrors and challenges and things, and the game gets more progressively difficult as you become more anxious and your heart rate rises. So you actually need to practice the skill of breathing and moderating um, your level of calmness so that you can progress through the game. So, yeah, there's lots of games and development happening which allow you to practice those real life skills, and it's a very exciting field. Yeah, mm. and I've now got one in the US prison system um, that teaches cog skills, cog but, cognitive skills. So, yeah. On that note, yeah. do those games ever like. So, those games are overt about the fact that they are For sure. attempting to help. Is that. Is that right? Oh, well, the, definitely the intention is to be, it's a, it's yeah. a mindfulness relaxation game, but it like does not look like that. Mm, it's yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Yes. Mm. Um, yes, in regards to multiplayer games, and it's not just digital board games, games of soccer, for example, is it possible, do you think, to break either the game's ethics or your own all, all the while thinking you know, you're perfectly fine, doing the right thing, the perfect ethics. Is it possible to go through the entire game never knowing that you're actually breaking those ethics? Oh, certainly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I think for like the for every one person that had the I'm gonna say correct response to Dark Souls, there would have been <laughs> yes. like however many people being like, ha, die. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like... Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's a very simple yes. Um, I mean, you've got people, I mean, worse than a cheat is someone who doesn't actually commit to the meaning of the game, right? So if you've ever, you ever played chess with someone, um, and I've played chess with someone, and I realised after about four moves, they were just creating a symmetrical battlefield. <laughs> they just really liked the look of it. That's and that right. was much more upsetting to me, because a cheater loves the game so much they want to win at any cost. Give me a cheater any day over someone who doesn't even care about winning or losing. <laughs> so, yeah. I uh, uh, Star Trek actually brought out that the entire topic, actually, um, I forget what the, the episode is called, was two players were playing against each other. They both wanted to win, the one was always better. But once the other person realised that they would do anything to win, they would just say, OK, well, I'll mm -hmm. go for it. Even I'll always go for draw, mm. not for not for win. Mm. And then the example I wanted to give before was that, say you're a, a healer or or the goalie or something like that in in soccer, and you you know what your responsibilities are in that game, and you choose not to do it because either you don't know that you're supposed to do it. Like for example, in um, oh well, that's not a choice there. Yeah. You can't choose if you don't have the information. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the thing. And, yeah. and, and yeah. in those multiplayer you're games... You're not breaking, you're actually not doing what you're supposed yeah. to do. Especially in multiplayer games, they'll tell you. Yeah. Like, you, yeah. I'm sure we've yeah. all been told, like, <laughs> whether you're doing something yeah. correct or not. You're yeah. doing it wrong. Yeah, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Uh, one last question, I suppose, we've got two. And then, of course, we'll be around them, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. Does this work? Oh, yes, yeah. it does. Um, and I'll preface this with, uh, oh, shot mine is bad. Infinite worse, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Agreed. Anyway, just wanted to say that I feel that, um, particularly in the last couple of years, uh, ethics in games and exploring ethics and different choices has probably been worse than it was years ago. Look at games like the original Syndicate from 1993. If you wanted to, say you had to kill a government official in a limo and it was in a crowd, you could get one of your sidewalls to just go on the suicide bomb. <laughs> That stuff wouldn't fly nowadays with a different kind of uh, political correctness and that kind of thing. So, do you think that can affect ethics in games more than um, it has before, perhaps?
Uh, I don't know. Uh, like I, I, I'm a bit confused by the question because I'm just not yeah, sure so that like a, a suicide bomber robot is like more <laughs> ethical than like killing the person yourself. And yeah, I, I'd say if anything, like my perspective from my own work is that people seem to be a lot more aware of ethics and. I don't think that political correctness is like a barrier to ethics. I think that's built more like this. So yeah. it was, I'll rephrase it. Would a game like that be able to be released? Yeah. 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 Sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know. games like a. I think. I mean, like the subtext of this conversation is like Islamophobia exists, so you can't have suicide bombers anywhere. I think that there's plenty of games with suicide bombers in them that both are Muslim and aren't Muslim. Like the first thing is that a lot of very commercially successful games have very terrible politics. Um, like that's not that's not dying out. Um, but but on top of that, like I think that yeah, like like there's if if that mechanic. Like just to, to use a specific example of if the mechanic of like sending a suicide bomber in instead of doing it yourself is something that's of interest to the designer, they'll be like, oh, how do I avoid being Islamophobic? Not make the suicide bomber is Islam. Like, yeah, yeah. Muslim, and, you know. and like like to say that that, that 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 doesn't exist is just wrong as well. Like, I mean, again, like again, because I'm playing a lot of Battlefield One. If you get in a plane and you like crash it into someone, exactly. like, okay, that's you've done that. And there's nothing in the game that's like, hey, you want to take the plane and crash it into like suicide bomber kamikaze? Mm. No, it's it's still there. It's not going away. It's just it's just yeah. been hidden. Yeah, I was playing this. It's, it's within play. With this asshole medic the other night. He wouldn't stop <laughs> <laughs> <Like, laughs> Oh gosh, was he looking? I mean, he did. <laughs> Handsome chap, I didn't know. Dashing. Uh, that's it, that's, that's time. It, so thank you so thank much, everyone.